Hi, everybody. Welcome to this edition of The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. Uh, great to see John back in the comments, welcoming everybody before we're even live. That is dedication, <laughs> let me tell you. And welcome back. All right. So before we get started with, today, with tonight's show, pretty excited about this one. I think it's going to be pretty great. Um, I do want to remind everybody that you can, of course, qualify for CEU credits uh, for watching the program. Just head over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow morning. Uh, enter in your info and we'll get those CEU credits to you uh, sometime in the next couple weeks. Um, so yes. All right. Yes. Peter Johnson, thank you for pointing out. Yes, my hair is curly. <laughs> it is 30 some thousand degrees with the Humidex, I don't know, somewhere north of 60 or 70%, I swear. And uh, I am melting. I'm actually melting. Um, so if you see me fanning myself, it's just, I live in an old farmhouse with no air conditioning. Okay, so that's enough about uh, old houses and humidity. Uh, tonight we are talking Fusarium head blight, probably a few other serial diseases as well, but we're going to focus on um, FHB. And so to uh, take us on this journey, I've got Joanna Fallings. She's a serial specialist with OMAFRA and Kelly Turkington, plant pathologist with AAFC out of Lacombe. Welcome here, Joanna. Welcome here, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. All right. All right. Um, I promised Joanna that we would not do a segment on what is it like to take over from Wheat Pete. That's going to be its own program. Tune in for the details. Um, but he, <laughs> but Pete is hour. here, of course. <laughs> yeah, we only have an hour. That's right. That's why it's going to be its own show. Um, but uh, I, I am going to endeavor to get to all three of our clips tonight. Uh, Kelly, you're in one of them. Um, so we'll, we'll see if we can. But let's start with a bit of the lay of the land with Fusarium head blight. Kelly, I'll start with you. Um, this is a relatively new disease to Alberta that they acknowledge and Anyway, um, where are we at with with the province um, and threat levels this year so far? Well, a lot of that will depend on what happens over the next two to three weeks in terms of weather conditions. And as this spring crop comes into flag leaf emergence and, and head emergence, certainly in Alberta, I think the the fusarium situation in, in a number of areas now is is probably no different than what you have in Saskatchewan and some areas, let's say that area uh, north of Lloyd Minister towards Metal Lake and so on, Maqua. Uh, so certainly in East Central Alberta, it is an issue that if you look at some of the uh, uh, information from the seed testing labs, uh, Griminiarum, fusarium Griminiarum has become a quite well established there. Certainly in Southern Alberta, it's been uh, esta well established probably since the uh, 2005, six, somewhere in there. So it's mm -hmm. definitely an issue uh, that is affecting producers in a number of areas in the province now. Joanna, do you hear that and think, wow, if only it had been since 2005, 2006. Um, okay, I, one of the reasons I wanted to do this episode this week, and, and really we probably should have done it a week or two ago, is because for our winter wheat crop here in Ontario, we are right in the thick of things. So um, what have you been advising growers on in the last few days? Yeah, so uh, unlike Western Canada, Fusarium head blight is probably the number one challenge in winter wheat production. And so every year, this is the time of year where growers are gearing up uh, to get in the field. And so, so far this year, we've had a pretty dry growing season. Uh, we haven't had a lot of moisture uh, for most of Ontario. But interesting enough, we've had all of these, uh, you know, little sprinkles of rainfall events here and there all throughout the heading period. So heading has started here in Ontario about two weeks ago, and we've been seeing some sporadic rainfall events depending on where you are in the province. The other thing is uh, we've had some pretty heavy morning dews. So it's it's not always just about the rainfall, but also the amount of moisture and, and humidity within that canopy. And so for growers right now making some of these decisions, one of the things we're, we're keeping an eye on is, you know, what are your pants like when you're walking your fields in the morning? Uh, are, are your pants still wet at 10, 11 a.m.? If so, you've still got that humidity, that moisture in the canopy, which is very conducive for fusarium development. Development. So um, depending on where growers are in the province, if they've experienced these rainfall events uh, the last week or so, they have been going and making those fungicide applications because there's a risk. Uh, but if you're in the part of the province where you've had no rainfall events, no rain during uh, heading and through pollination, uh, the risk is, is, 
is likely much lower compared to those that have yeah received moisture. Mm -hmm. Okay, and actually, I think in in two of the three clips tonight, there was a reference to the pants test. So this is oh, very perfect. technical, everyone. Yeah, this is super <laughs> yeah. technical. Um, they, yeah, but hey, it's effective and it's it's useful and it's what everybody can do, right? So that's a okay. Um, so Kelly, we, I mean, yes, Western Canada, far more spring acres for sure. A little earlier in the growing season there, as far as uh, where the crop is at. What are levels of other leaf diseases like so far? Huh. Well, we're starting to hear reports of some of the sort of leaf spot complex, both in wheat and barley. Uh, at right now, uh, we are fortunately not seeing any reports of uh, rust, especially leaf rust and stripe rust. Uh, a lot of that uh, comes up from the U.S. And if you look at the Pacific Northwest this year, they've probably got some of the lowest levels of stripe rust that they've had in commercial fields uh, compared to the last several years. So we do get a lot of rust being rust spores being blown up from Idaho, Washington State, and Oregon into the Western Prairie Region, uh, East Cent East the Eastern Prairie Region uh, uh, to the Central Prairie Region, most of the inoculum would come up from that Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska corridor. So there's some stripe rust that's certainly been reported in Kansas and Nebraska. Okay. They're seeing reports in South Dakota and even Minnesota. So it's something that we need to, to look at. Mm -hmm. So, and Kara actually, who's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure which platform she's on, but Kara is out in Alberta and she says the wind in Southern Alberta will not stop blowing. Um, does this play into disease risk? So obviously the, the rusts are a concern, but, but are you concerned with the incredible wind uh, Southern Alberta has been under for quite some time? Certainly the, you know, the, of course, the rust blowing up from the States is the primary concern, but uh, with these strong winds and severe weather events, uh, there are other issues that rely on wounding in the plant. So we've had some concerns regarding bacterial leaf streak uh, over the last several years, but especially 2019 and 2020 uh, in Alberta, as well as Manitoba and uh and saskatchewan so that uh, heavy or very strong winds may lead to some damage which could facilitate bacterial leaf streak development okay um i before we go to our first clip which features someone you may know kelly trickington um joanna i did want to touch very briefly on physiological fleck <laughs> In the Ontario wheat crop, Wheat Pete sent me a message and said, Lindsay, you have to reshare the video I did a couple of years ago and put it back in the emails and tell everybody because it, it is rearing its head in Ontario and everybody needs to know what it is. So what's the, yes. yeah, what's the latest there? So physiological fleck, this is a, a phenomenon that we've observed in Ontario the last, well, a number of years. Uh, a couple years ago, it was really bad in a particular variety, but this year it has really shown up and it's been uh, commonly mistaken for other diseases, including leaf or stripe rust, uh, but uh, we are seeing it in certain varieties. Um, there's a handful of them, R40, R74, for example. Uh, as far as we know, there is no uh, management that we can do in terms of fungicides. Fungicides aren't effective on physiological effect or fleck. And we're actually not entirely sure what causes uh, the physiological flecking to happen. Uh, we suspect what happens or when it tends to happen the most is uh, when we have a lot of cloudy conditions, it's cool, uh, followed by very hot sunny weather. So what happens in those situations is we get a very thin cuticle on the leaf and then we get what's essentially a sunburn. Some varieties seem to be more prone than others. We are also wondering about other stress factors, uh, you know, whether that's it's something to do with nutrients. So we thought of, or other jurisdictions have looked at a chloride deficiency. So in Oregon and Texas, Texas, for example, they've looked at this. Um, and it's something that we need to definitely explore here because we're seeing it quite a bit more. So we're still trying to dive in and, and figure out what exactly is the cause of it or what we can do to remediate remediate it um, but it is definitely something that we're keeping an eye on and as far as we know we don't believe there are huge yield impacts we've seen it so so bad in other varieties in the past and they've still yielded excellent but uh, we're not quite sure what's happening there so if anyone has experienced this uh, please reach out because we're trying to track this and if you're trying anything like the application of um, potassium chloride or anything like that to help remediate the, the issue please let us know uh, so we can follow along with you Okay. I just want to know who named it physiological fleck because it's hard to say. 
So <laughs> I would just, I'm just going to put that out there. Um, uh, Farmer Schneck, so Warren Schneckenberger out uh, near my neck of the woods here. Uh, he says his R74 has the fleck. Um, which is a great way to put it. And three nights of frost really brought it on. So a lot of plant stress there. Yeah, that we we suspect there's something to do. It's stress environment. It's also the variety. It definitely shows up in more varieties than others. Uh, we just haven't quite figured out exactly what that cause is. Um, so we're going to keep digging. <laughs> okay. Have you considered sunscreen? Okay. Um, just <laughs> Ask Mark McLean about that one. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, well, he just needs it in general. He's a ginger. Um, okay, so Pete does, Pete does have a question, though, for you, Kelly. How often is bacterial leaf streak a problem, as in you, uh, as, that you often have wind? And I would like to point out to Kara that she complains about the wind a lot, but it is always windy in southern Alberta. So That's an interesting question. You know, I've been in this, this position since the mid-90s, and we'll see bacterial leaf streak, we'll see a spotting halo blight note and so on. But often it's been more of a curiosity in some of our disease screening nurses. It might be one uh, particular hill plot out of several thousand. Uh, but over the last probably eight to nine years, we've seen issues where producers have uh, fungicide performance concerns where it appears not to actually work at all. And probably the first example of that that I came came across was in about 2012. Last year, Mike Harding, who's at uh, El with Albert Ag and Brooks, had a number of uh, calls, and I we had also calls here in central Alberta. But there were some fields where they estimated yield losses in that maybe 30 to 40 percent range and a lot of the areas where they had significant concerns were areas where they had severe weather events so thunderstorm systems that came through strong winds uh, heavy rain driving rain uh, and so on and those are all conditions that can facilitate development of this issue so mm, okay um pete would like to point out that wheat has all the fun terms like physiological fleck also peduncle which i do like i also like penultimate for the penultimate leaf so you can't say I, that you can't oh see okay no. but so maybe pete's yeah pete's got a point uh there are some cool ones okay you know what jay uh let's let's producer jay is in my ear for anyone watching at home uh jay let's run the first clip with kelly turkington talking about conditions uh conducive not conducive to fusarium development Dry conditions yes. across big parts of Western Canada. It, this is a year where do I apply a fungicide is a little bit of a tougher decision making process with yes. the variability that we're seeing. In terms of uh, fusarium head blight, should like, how do you how do you do that evaluation? How do I decide? Uh, well, there's a number of things that you need to look at. So obviously, one thing is uh, what your history of disease is like on your operation and maybe immediately adjacent field. So that gives you a feeling for the amount of fusarium graminearum that you might have around. So let's say, that, say for the sake of argument, you, you have had issues with downgrading in your harvested grain due to fusarium damaged kernels or FDK. Uh, you've had some of the grain tested by the seed testing labs and they've picked up graminearum. So you know that it's an issue, a pathogen that you have. Um, but if you look at disease development, you, you need a susceptible host. So of course we have that. But the next key component, and probably the one that trumps everything, is, is the weather conditions. And if you have dry conditions throughout June, you're going to have very little activity of that fusarium fungus on the overwintering crop residue in terms of producing the windborne stage. So when the crop comes into flag leaf and transitions into head emergence, you're not going to have, with these dry conditions, a lot of spore production and spore dispersal. So your risk is going to be quite low. So in that situation, if you follow the crop for leaf disease development, uh, you look at the risk maps that Alberta Wheat Commission and Alberta Agriculture and, and Forestry have online. They're excellent tools to give you an indication of whether the, the, the environment has been favorable for for uh, fusarium and, and the risk. So based on that information, you know, you, you know if, if it's dry, if the forecast for the next two weeks is for dry conditions and temperatures, you know, daily highs in that 25 to 35 degrees C range, 
the risk there is is very limited as far as as fusarium head blight so spraying a fungicide would likely have limited or no effect as far as reducing disease uh, reducing the amount of FDK in the harvested grain uh, and so on because you simply wouldn't have disease development occurring get out in those fields and take a look what's going on yes and, and look at the risk maps uh, and you know one simple strategy that 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 I talked I've talked about in terms of sclerotinia is uh, go out into that field and if you go out at 8 or 9 in the morning and the soil surface is dry, your boots don't get muddy, the crop canopy is dry, those are conditions that are not conducive to disease development, whether it's fusarium or leaf diseases in your wheat. Conversely, if you go out into a field at 2 or 3 in the afternoon and uh, your boots are muddy, your pants are wet up to your crotch, you've got environmental conditions in that crop that would facilitate either leaf disease development or, or fusarium. I just, I, I love your summer look, Kelly. I'll be honest. <laughs> Pretty great. Pretty that's, great my, that's my yeah. I, uh, Boise, Idaho Army surplus store hat. So I, I like it. I got to tell you, it keeps the ears covered. You know, it's it, this is important for when we're allowed back on that again and the head yeah. when you don't have any hair so right okay there you go <laughs> that is also important and john comments this video is a couple years old how long has real ag radio been in the 4 30 eastern time slot it is true when real ag radio started it was a 4 p.m time slot and it changed that video is from 2018 so um a few growing seasons from 2018 to now kelly but of course for parts of alberta anyway still very very dry um have you seen an increase in fusarium head blight levels from 2018 till now, regardless of that, that dry bias? Uh, yes. So uh, if you go back, 2016 was sort of a, a quite a favorable year for development of FHB across the prairie region. And then we had a couple of years that were fairly dry. So 2017 and 18 in many areas of the prairies. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of development. 2019 was a bit a bit more favorable and and also 2020 so in some areas southern alberta especially under irrigation or that uh, sort of east central alberta area lloyd minister uh vermilion vigorville and even in some areas around edmonton they've had some issues in terms of griminiarum and likely potential downgrading okay so that actually brings me to the slide kelly that you showed and and joanna this is one of those things that we're going to talk about in a little bit about timing that app that potentially first application of a fungicide but jay if you can bring up the slide that kelly shared about the damage that this disease causes on the kernel or to the kernel and and maybe kelly you can walk us through sort of this shows sure. sort of the earlier that um that it's infected, the more damage that happens. So if you can walk us through this. Sure. So this the slide actually comes from Randy Clear. He used to be a mycologist with the Canadian Grain Commission, but he tried to show the impact of fusarium infection date on symptom development. So if you have infection right around that anthesis timing, uh, which is a critical timing in terms of spraying a fungicide, you're going to see your more, most severe development of, of FDK. You know, some of those will likely get blown out the back of the combine. You won't harvest them, but a lot of them will be taken up with the harvested grain and then resulting in downgrading. And of course, a fairly heavy uh, uh, mycotoxin load. But the thing to keep in mind is that this pathogen can actually infect that cereal head anytime uh, from the point that it comes out of the boot to senescence. And uh, if we look at some historical outbreaks, especially soft weight spring in the US in 2003 and then in Manitoba in 2008, they had conditions that were fairly dry at Anthesis and, and uh, the in-crop surveys, uh, some of the early assessments that were done by the Canadian Grain Commission suggested a fairly light year for fusarium damage, especially in terms of the grain itself it looked healthy, it did not look infected. Now what happened is that uh, some of the companies looking at accessing those soft white spring uh, uh, varieties or, or other varieties here in Western Canada did some secondary quality control testing. And they found that those that grain that looked healthy visually actually had levels of 
uh, dioxin and volanol or Dawn that were over the the uh, uh, tolerable level in terms of human consumption. So that to me that's a, that that adds an, an additional difficult aspect of of getting good management of of FHB because you could be doing everything right. You get that product on at the right time, right around anthesis. You use that good application technology. And if you, and that chemical likely probably will have its most activity for about a, a seven, sort of probably a 10 to 14 day period, depending on the product. Beyond that, if you have conditions that are favorable for spore production, dispersal, and, and infection of the host, you could have superficial infection as the crop is moving towards mid milk, late milk, such that the kernels themselves look fine, but they're contaminated with Dawn. So it, it's a difficult thing, but if you're looking at FDK, probably the, the, the best timing in terms of spraying a fungicide would be right around that anthesis to try and limit those very severe infections. The challenge then is trying to minimize Dawn and how long of activity you have with your fungicide and so on. Okay. So Joanna, this is, you know, the Ontario climate is such that, I mean, it's, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that you have to spray at least once and hopefully you've got your timing right. Um, but as Kelly explains, I mean, this disease continues to, to grow and can continue to infect quite late. So, um, what is what have you seen happening with dawn levels in the wheat crop here? So back in the 90s, we had a really, really bad outbreak. Uh, we had very high FDK and dawn levels in wheat production. And I would say it's probably at that time, if you look at the history, where things really started to shift in management, but also uh, variety development. And so we've seen a huge shift uh, where we no longer have highly susceptible varieties even available for growers in Ontario. Uh, so we've really worked hard, or not, I shouldn't say we, the breeders uh, have really worked we. hard. Yeah, <laughs> we, uh, the, the, the team. <laughs> Yeah, the Royal We, uh, they have worked really, really hard to move uh, the varieties that are available from being highly susceptible to moderately resistant or moderately susceptible. So so that's one aspect. Um, and so over time, we've really seen, you know, the the uh, the availability of varieties with more resistance, along with a ton of research that's been done by Dr. Dave Hooker, Peter Johnson, who we all know, Art Shasma. They've done a lot of work over the years on application technology, uh, f f timing, uh, you know, speed, all of those things which we're going to get into today. And we've really seen over time uh, a reduction. We've able been able to maintain low levels of fusarium and Don in the province. Now, that doesn't mean we go through every year without having high levels in some fields. There are those instances where we just don't time uh, it right. Maybe our crop rotation is after corn, our, our pathogen load is high. So we can still get those instances where we, we run into that. But I would say for the most part, growers and uh, the, the whole wheat community in Ontario have really done a good job of, of trying to manage this disease in the province. We're not perfect, mm -hmm. but we're, we're definitely moving the bar ahead, I would say. Mm -hmm. And so, and this though speaks to the importance of just like with corn, when that crop is ready to come off, get it out of the field. Yeah. So the, if you leave that crop, if we're at, at harvest, we're mature, anything, um, you know, if we're above 19%, that fusarium can still continue to grow. So the more rainfall events that occur while that, if that crop has hit physiological maturity, you get a rainfall event. Uh, we're going to see those, that fusarium or the possibility of that fusarium infection going up. So we need to get it off the field. So always target those fields with the highest levels of fusarium. If you can visually see that you want to get those off uh, first and fast. Okay. Ray wants me to say deoxy, not wait, deoxy, nivalinol, close. Anyway, I just say Dawn. <laughs> so thanks, Ray. Anyway, it's Dawn. It's all bad. It's okay. That's all we need to know. All right. Um, so, so that is one of the things that of course we do have to be concerned about is this is a disease that continues to develop um, and can, as Kelly alluded to with, with that research that even without visual issues on kernels, we can still have mycotoxin development. We can still have Dawn development. So super important. Uh, Peter wants to know, Kelly, what about spread within the head? So does that happen a well, lot? That, that's uh, that's a, an excellent question. Certainly, the the initial infection that would occur 
soon after hen emergence, uh, you know, you would have individual uh, spikelets or florets within that head. And then the fungus will then transition in wheat, especially not so much in barley is my understanding, but in wheat will transition up and down the rachis. Uh, so it can move that way. The other thing is the fungus, if you have human conditions and an infected tissue in the head, you'll have the production of the rain splash stage and then that will facilitate further spread within that head from one infect infected spikelet uh, further to other parts of the head or to adjacent healthy heads. The other thing is that you have to keep in mind is that the fungus is still active on the residue if you have favorable moisture especially and within a certain temperature range certainly that you're still going to have spore showers occurring throughout uh, uh, the grain filling period. So you could limit the infection initially, limit the amount of the rain splash spore stage on that infected head, head tissue, but you still potentially could have spore showers as the crop is progressing into milk, uh, mid milk, late milk, and so on, which then could cause some issues with dawn. Okay. Okay. I think, um, and Lara usually makes fun of me because I take forever to get to the next clip. But I think actually this is a good time to run one of my favorite clips because it features Holly Dirksen, who at the time was a plant pathologist with uh, MAFRI when it was called MAFRI. And she is about 20 months pregnant. And we, it was a super hot day and I made her go out in the field and shoot this video with me. And I don't think that she's ever forgiven me for it. But if we talk very much about what is day zero, timing that timing this this potentially first application or or one application and so we'll go to this clip and then that's what we're going to dig into is is you know how do we count days and which days are we targeting so jay if uh yes the journey to clip two with holly dirksen as soon as it's time to spray the t3 fungicide what happens everybody So today we're here, we're going to be talking about PEAK, which is the predictive equation for alfalfa quality. It's the Holly Dirksen one. Okay. So Jay, close, but no cigar. That one was the wheat peat one. And then we went to last week's that I didn't run. So he's going to find it and it's going to be okay. I will find uh, it. You guys can You will find it. But we're not going to the wheat peat one yet because that one is, uh, we are going to talk about nozzles and droplet size and all those sorts of things. So while he is queuing up the correct one, um, yeah, nice try, Jay, Jay uh, Peter says. Um, okay, so let's talk before we watch this video then. Um, what, Joanna, what is day zero and why does day zero matter so much when we're staging our wheat fields? Okay, so in Ontario, we refer to the our optimum timing, we talk to days. So day zero is when 75% of the heads have emerged. So we've got that uh, peduncle has cleared uh, the ligule and we've got 75% of the heads emerged. That's what we consider day zero. Then the day that we are targeting our fungicide application is day two. So it's simply day two days after that, when we've seen those anthers starting on the middle of that wheat head. The trick, however, we use these high level uh, terms of day zero, day one, day two to try to time this perfectly. The challenge is uh, the weather. <laughs> so if it's a really hot, dry year like this, if we've got temperatures during the daytime, you know, 30 degrees Celsius, uh, that day one or that day two can happen in the matter of a couple of hours. So we can really, really tighten up that window. So this is why it is so, so critical to scout your fields. I, I know you hear this from every agronomist ever, but scout your wheat fields at heading timing. Look for those heads emerged and keep an eye for when it begins to flowering. On a more cool year where we don't have extreme heat like this, it tends to be quite normal in that day one, day two falls quite nicely. Uh, but again, hot, dry year, it goes much quicker. Now, uh, this is, has always been sort of the ideal timing we've been telling growers to target. However, there's been some new research as well as some new fungicides coming to the market. And so that application window is actually a bit wider. And so we can probably apply that fungicide, you know, up to day four or day five. And why does that matter? 
Uh, well, so first, I guess the reason we're targeting day two is because that is when the most number of florets are, are open and are vulnerable on the wheat heads. So we're trying to protect that uh, wheat head from that. Uh, with these new fungicides, we're able to get up to day three, day four. So if you've got a crop that's uneven, for example, uh, you've got uneven emergence throughout the growing season, or you've got your heading timing from your main stem to your tillers, uh, maybe your tillers are a bit later, with that later application window, we can actually ensure that those heads have fully emerged as well and protect those as well. So we can still get really good efficacy uh, later in the season, or if you've got windy weather or rainy weather and you just weren't able to get out and get on day two, you can still go a little bit later. And uh, something that, uh, you know, in talking in the fields last week uh, last week with Peter, one of the comments he made was, it's, it's always better to go a day later uh, on day three or day four versus a day early. If we go too early, we can miss protecting a lot of those heads if they haven't cleared um, and uh, or haven't fully emerged and, and those tillers especially. So we could still keep them, they might still be vulnerable to fusarium and at the end of the day, then your application uh, wasn't as effic uh, efficacious as you were hoping. So um I really did hope that a day was actually a day, but it turns out a day isn't a day. A day is a certain <laughs> amount of heat that accumulates. So yeah, so certainly in this in these really hot temps, this plant is zooming through these stages and we may not have the time that we thought we did. Now I will say um, this is where uniformity I would think really comes into play in that I have scouted wheat fields and looking for anthers and all those sorts of things and thinking, I don't know. Is this day two? Okay, so Jay, actually, so uh, maybe we'll, I won't worry about Holly's video just yet, although at some point I would like to play it just because she's adorable um, with her giant belly in a wheat field. Uh, but let's go to some of the images um, because I think this is still, staging that field is still a bit of a challenge when you do have tillers or variability or these sorts of things where it's different. Um, and so I'm not sure which, maybe, yeah, yeah this one. So yeah. Joanna, what what is this? <laughs> stage um I, I, nobody can see my mouse i'm guessing right <laughs> no okay but you can so, just okay. rest your wildly <laughs> like i do yeah uh okay so here on this photo actually there's a couple of things i would like to say about this photo so this i actually just took on thursday so this is a field that was just at day zero so you could see that those heads have fully emerged we don't have any uh flowering starting we don't see any of those yellow anthers on the the wheat head there i know we've got another photo up here shortly uh so this is what we consider day zero so from this point on we would be coming back to this field and two days from this point we would like to spray or would likely be our ideal application window on a moderate normal year. Um, the other thing I would like to point out here, and it might be difficult to see for, for some folks if you're on a smaller screen, but if you could take a look, this was a very, very dewy morning. So you can see there's lots of dew on those anthers and on the leaves there and are on the leaves there. And so that's what I wanted to point out when we were talking earlier is that just because you don't necessarily have a lot of rainfall, if you've got a lot of dew, especially heavy dews in the morning and you're walking these fields, uh, you know, I came out of this field around noon and I was, I was soaking wet. So it's still very conducive for fusarium development. Um, but this is what we would consider day zero there. So you can see that head, uh, that peduncle is just starting to poke through. It's cleared that ligule. Uh, and so we would consider this to be day zero when 75% of those heads have fully emerged. And hey, then Jay. I think there's How another the photo there. there. we go. Yep. Yeah, so this there is not go. an ideal, this is actually a, a good point to what you're saying, Lindsay, how, how difficult it can be uh, targeting uh, that timing and figuring out, okay, what is day two? Well, you can see I've got one head here that has just started to flower. This I wouldn't consider day two. This is probably day one. Uh, or so we've got some heads that are starting to flower, but we would really like to see more of those heads flowering. You, the anthers will always begin in the middle of the wheat head. So you'll start to see them in the middle of the head and then they'll start to uh, go out through the rest of the head. And once we get to 50% of the heads totally flowering, so you've got flowers up and down this entire head, 50% uh, of the field, that's sort of the nearing the end of our window of application. And what you'll actually start to see is those yellow anthers uh, will start to actually turn white and then they'll start to fall off the wheat head. So question for both of you, really, if, if I get into my field and those anthers are white, 
as we've discussed, and Kelly, this will get into maybe some of the other slides that you sent. Is it too late or is it still worth going in there? So Kelly, I'll start with you because Joanna's sharing well, her beautiful picture. Yeah. <laughs> I guess my, my comment there would be to look at the risk maps that you have. And uh, uh, you may have a situation where the risk is in that low or low to moderate category as it's coming into that uh, head emergence, that, that sort of zero day uh, scenario. And then perhaps uh, over the next several days, you start to see some rainfall occurring and that risk level as indicated by the risk map uh, starts to increase. Uh, the challenge is the, uh, the label uh, window that you have in your guides to crop protection. Uh, you know, uh, that uh, and that, you know, you're going to be pushing up against that. So mm -hmm. you definitely don't want to be looking at an off label application. Uh, the other thing would be your pre harvest interval that you'd have to look at. But, you know, if you look at some of the work done out of the states uh, by D'Angelo and then more, most recently by Pierce Paul, uh, Randy uh, Kucher at the U of S had a grad student that looked at some, some timing. Uh, we're doing some work looking at about seven to 10 days after uh, that sort of key timing. And we can see some very good levels of control, both in terms of fusarium symptoms, but also in terms of dawn. Uh, now, when I say control, I mean suppression. So, you know, mm -hmm. that delay, a lot of the, the more recent research suggests that you can still get actually really good, reasonable suppression along the lines of that key timing. But I think it all goes back to what the weather conditions are like and whether they're conducive for germination of those spores and infection of that head tissue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have two two questions here, um, but I want to go. So Pete is mentioning um, that picture, Joanna, that you have showing how heavy that dew can be um, explains why we can have mildew issues, powdery mildew issues in a dry year. And we actually have a picture. Pete, it's like you knew what we were going to talk about, uh, if Jay can find it, um, of certainly mildew uh, levels this year, which has surprised, I think, some growers with how dry it's been. Yeah, so this is actually in the same field. <laughs> and so uh, powdery mildew, uh, this is uh, an interesting one this year. I have, in, I've been in this position for six years and I've never seen powdery mildew at this level. It's been quite surprising. Um, but one of the things that we did have in Ontario this year was a very mild winter, which is perfect for powdery mildew to be able to survive. The other cool thing about powdery mildew, or I still like cool thing, <laughs> sound like Albert, uh, I guess a misconception of powdery mildew is that it thrives in, in, in rainy conditions, really rainy wet conditions. But what powdery mildew actually thrives in is high humidity. And so that's mm. what Peter just mentioned in the chat there. So if we've got lots of humidity in that canopy, powdery mildew explodes and so this is actually coming to play into the decision making for t3 fungicides this year in ontario there's lots of growers who haven't applied a t1 or a t2 just because they didn't have the disease pressure early on but as we're going back to time for our t3 fungicide applications we're coming across high levels of powdery mildew and so it's starting to reach that penultimate leaf leaf as well as the flag leaf and that becomes a concern uh, Phil Needham, as many of you uh, probably know of him from the States, you know, he always says that that flag leaf is 70% of our yield and we want to keep that flag leaf green and clean. So in some instances, we're actually targeting powdery mildew right now because it is at really high pressures. And if it's starting to reach the penultimate or the flag leaf, that's where we really start to get concerned. And, it, and so if growers have a variety that is highly susceptible, th those are the situations that we're going out and targeting for powdery mildew. There has been some instances though where growers were you know 10 to 14 days still away from their t3 fungicide application and so they were having to go in and spray earlier on uh, but this is definitely disease we're having to keep an eye for this year and and as was mentioned in the chat it really comes down to the humidity that's been in the canopy not so much the rainfall which i think has been a bit surprising to to a lot of growers this year for sure. Okay, Kelly, I've got a question for you here from Gord. I'm not even going to try that last name. Do we assume fusarium is present and will cause infection when conditions are right? Or can we assess local risk to decide if fungicide is warranted? Um, you did mention a lab test, field history, that sort of stuff. So what can we assume? Now, this is for Alberta, not Ontario, because Ontario, I think it's yes. But for Alberta, anyway, can, can we make that assumption? 
You know, we get a very similar question in terms of sclerotinia and canola. And if you talk to people in Manitoba, they say it's there, it's ubiquitous. Uh, whereas elsewhere in the prairies, people talk about testing inoculum load. And that, you know, if you look at fusarium, uh, it's largely a monocyclic disease. So the amount of disease at the end of the season will be reflective of the amount of inoculum floating around. So, uh, you know, perhaps not in, in central Canada or the Maritimes, but maybe here in the prairie region, uh, assessing pathogen load in the air, either via spore trapping or some other methodology, may be quite useful to, to provide an additional picture or piece of the puzzle in terms of risk and need to spray. The other thing is you might be able to monitor spore load to really tweak the timing. So if the spore load is really high as the crop is coming in to head emergence, that might be a situation where you wanna spray uh, as soon after head emergence as possible. If that spore load is relatively low, but then starts to increase post head emergence, that's where maybe a little later might uh, be a, a more effective uh, tool. So the challenge though, in terms of assessing an oculum load is how you do it. And that, uh, you know, we're starting to see some, some, some technology like the Spornado spore trap. It's, it's not a, a quantitative spore trap. It's it's more qualitative, but that potentially could provide some additional guidance in terms of overall risk, but then really tweaking your timing combined with looking at your weather risk maps. Mm -hmm. uh, so apparently I don't know Gord um, and he is from Ontario. So I, I think Kelly's answer is still warranted, uh, but Farmer Schneck, so Warren tells me that Gord is from the Middle East, um, which that's also not Ontario. Warren. Um, but anyway, so so I got the same question to you then, Joanna. I mean, I, I, I haven't lived in Ontario that long, but it's sort of my assumption that if you have had wheat any time in the last few years, it's essentially endemic here, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we also have uh, a comp, I shouldn't say a common, but another practice that is utilized in Ontario for livestock producers is to plant their wheat after corn silage um, if they are able to, because it enables them to get the crop planted much earlier than trying to wait for their soybeans to come off. And in shorter growing regions, uh, this has huge benefits. So, but the growers that do that are aware of the fusarium risk. They will first line of defense is variety. Uh, we can't just solely depend on fungicides. So the first line of defense in those situations is selecting a variety with good fusarium tolerance. We don't have 100% tolerance, but having something with some moderate resistance will be the first option. Um, and then they, they know in those instances, if they're following corn silage, or if they've got lots of wheat in the rotation, then they are auto generally applying that T3 fungicide because they know that the risk in the, that situation is high. Um, but, you know, and I, I'm sure we'll get into some of this, but, you know, crop rotation, resistant variety, all those come into play um, when trying to make decisions on whether or not you need to spray or to determine your risk. We also, Absolutely. oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Okay. The other awesome tool that we have in Ontario, and I apologize, I'm not sure if there's something like this in Western Canada, but is Dawncast. So Dawncast is a model that was developed uh, at Ridgetown University of Gulf uh, with our Chasma there. And Dawncast, it, it uses predicted weather, so it's not absolutely perfect by any means, but it does give you an idea based on your heading date, the variety. It even brings into your know, previous tillage practices, that sort of thing. Uh, and into determining your risk. So it'll tell you your risk is low, medium or high. Um, so it's another tool that's available for growers. So you can go to decisionfarm.com backslash agris or backslash wanstead and you can access that. You can just set up your field in there and it'll let you know what your risk is based on your approximate uh, heading date. Okay, who let, who let Art Shasma retire? That's just, come on now. Should have um, never happened. Right? <laughs> anyway, um, also, Joanna, I do want to say thank you for getting a shout out to Albert Tenuta in this, in saying that powdery mildew is cool, which it is not. Um, okay, so, um, yes, Spornado does make me giggle. I think it's a great name. So thanks, Ray, for pointing it out. Uh, we have two questions that I do want to cover. Um, uh, Warren wants to know, uh, probably because um, he's he had frost um, just last weekend on his wheat crop. Uh, when corn successfully pollinates, the silk falls off. Is there an equivalent sign in wheat of successful pollination? Because heat blast and cold could be bad. So, so does wheat let us know 
that it's actually been pollinated? You know, I think probably, unfortunately, you'd have to wait until the kernels start to fill. So you start to see that individual florid expanding. That would give you an indication of uh, successful pollination. Uh, unsuccessful pollination, you'd obviously have those, those florets and the grain within them not filling. So they would stay fairly narrow versus florets where the grains are, are expanding. The other issue that you could encounter uh, is that if the, if the, the plant isn't isn't fertilized, and, and maybe there's issues with pollen sterility. That could be due to a, a frost. Is that you start to see some issues with ergot? So you might see mm -hmm. some right. uh, some of the honeydew stage initially, and then eventually mm -hmm. towards the latter part of grain filling and and senescence, you'd see the ergot bodies. I totally forgot about ergot. Joanna, yeah, ergot is not as common of an issue in Ontario as Western Canada. We're thankfully lucky that way. I would say for those, if there are concerns about frost damage, you might see bleached heads uh, that might occur, like so they're looking white or the awns look bleached. Um, but generally speaking, you know, right now for in the fields that I've been in anyways, you know, we're seeing those nice, beautiful yellow anthers covering the whole head. And generally speaking, when pollination is complete, those will turn white and fall to the ground. Um, but as Kelly said, it uh, might still be one of those wait and see situations, but hopefully we've dodged the frost bullet uh, here in Ontario for the most part. We thought that and then it was May 30th. So I'm just saying, yeah. what the heck? <laughs> anyway, we, we also got frost, um, not as bad certainly as the Northern areas, but uh, yes. So um, yeah. Jason has a great question about split applications or, or two applications, um, but I want to get to Wheat Pete's video on, this is this is actually our latest wheat school. Um, this is on droplet size. So so not just nozzle selection, but droplet size and the importance of um, targeting the head, of course, for fusarium uh, applications. Um, so Jay, please tell me you have the correct video that it is Wheat Pete talking about nozzles and droplet size. I make Here no we promises. Go. Okay, thanks, Jay. <laughs> as soon as it's time to spray the T3 fungicide, what happens? Everybody's texting me and calling me and tweeting me, what are the best nozzles? And you know, we've done a ton of work on nozzles. There's some really excellent resources. We've done wheat schools on it. There's articles up on fieldcrotnews.com, Dave Hooker, Art Shaftsma, Albert Tenuta, tons of work. And so we know what the best nozzles are. And it tends to be the turbo flood jets, the forward back configuration, the 30, 70 nozzles work in there. But you gotta back up and say, well, wait a minute. If I buy the very best nozzles and I figure out, cause turbo flood jets are a pain in the butt, I gotta put a spacer in there to get them to drop down below the boom. Well, if I do that, have I solved the problem? And unfortunately, we slipped the clutch. We haven't talked enough about all the other factors. And do you know how many times I drive through the countryside and growers are spraying their T3 fungicide and they might as well be using flat fan nozzles. So we have not talked enough about droplet size. Why do turbo flood jets do a better job than forward back nozzles or than most of the others? Because they have a coarse droplet size. And when you look at the research, we need the coarse droplet. Why do we need a coarse droplet? Well, think about it. It's wind resistance. So we take that ping pong ball and we throw it as hard as we can into the wind. How far does it go? Now we take a hollow, bigger plastic ball of some nature, we throw that, it goes way further. So we just have to start paying more attention to droplet size. Are nozzles important? Yes. Is the correct timing important? Yes. But you can have the very best nozzles and you won't do a good job if you didn't pick, for example, a 3070 nozzle that can do an excellent job but it has to be the right nozzle that gives you at least 20 gallons per acre and a coarse droplet. So I get asked lots about these new 3D nozzles. They're designed for fungicide. Will they do wheat? And the answer is yes, they will. 
but unfortunately most of the 3D nozzles are targeted for a medium or a fine droplet. And that's like throwing the ping pong ball into the wind. And so to paint that wheat head, and it really comes down to the fact that we have to paint the back of the wheat head. It's not the front of the wheat head that we're worried about. Gosh, we can paint the front of the wheat head with anything. So it's as the sprayer goes past, going this way, it's this side. And so we gotta throw those balls, those, those coarse droplets enough that they beat the forward momentum, they beat the, the air that's slowing them down and they actually make it to that head. So droplet size. We don't think we want ultra coarse or extra coarse because then we don't have enough droplets to hit the head. We don't want fine. I mean, gosh, if you're gonna go out there and I have growers that tell me I'm gonna fog it on, baby, we're gonna up the, I gotta get good pressure. Man, you fog it on, all the droplets are going the same way. You will paint this side of the head beautifully and you will get nothing on this side of the head. That's called 50% efficacy at the very best. You gotta fog it on, baby. Okay, don't, actually. <laughs> you said don't do that. Um, there is, I, I want everyone watching this, if, if uh, that little clip is actually only half of that Wheat School, there's lots of good info after that. Um, so head on over to uh, Real Agriculture or go to wheatschool.com. You can see the rest of that. So realistically, I mean, we do get, every year we get a lot of questions about nozzle selection and, and you know, do I have to have them forward and back? Do I have to have all those things? And I think realistically it comes down to, yes, timing, but coverage. Right. I mean, so Joanna, what, how are you fielding these calls as well? I mean, are, are farmers trying new nozzles, trying to do a better job to paint that head? Yes. And I, so I'll say first and foremost, I depend solely on Jason DeVoe and Tom Wolf for their expertise and everything they've taught me. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And Peter did a great job in that video, but uh, I think the first thing that growers have to remember when we think about T3 fungicides in wheat is what we're trying to cover. Like we're trying to cover around and get full coverage around that head. We're not spraying a horizontal leaf or trying to get it down in the canopy. So we have a very different um, goal that we're trying to achieve. So I think that's the first thing. So, you know, why can't I use the same nozzles I use my herbicide or everything else? Like that's why, because we're trying to uh, get full circumference of that wheat head. And so dual nozzles, yes, absolutely. It's key to always have that backward nozzle, aggressive, or that backwards nozzle face aggressively back uh, to cancel the speed of the sprayer. In terms of the forward facing nozzle, it doesn't matter as much because we're always going to get that head when we're going forward. But it's really about trying to cancel out the speed or the momentum of that sprayer as we're going forward to make sure that we're getting good coverage of the back of the head. Otherwise, those droplets are just going to fall. And so the key with this, and as Peter mentioned in that video, um, is, is having coarse nozzle or coarse droplet sizes in order to get that good coverage. What happens when we have finer droplets? Well, if you have a windy day or if you're driving fast, those those droplets are going to go all over the place. You're, you're not going to get that target. And uh, that's even influenced even more depending on how fast you're going or how high uh, your boom is set at. So couple things, those hollow uh, cones, they have uh, no overlaps and they're very difficult to arrange uh, on the boom. So that's an issue with those 3D cones or those hollow cones, sorry. And then with the 3Ds, um, it does make an aggressive forward back, uh, but the droplet size is what the challenge is there. We can get some finer droplets with those 3D nozzles. Um, and so if it gets windy or if it's hot and we get some of that convection happening, it can actually lift those fine fine droplets and we can get totally off target so with the nozzles it's really about that forward backwards configuration but also to ensure that we have those coarse droplet sizes to get good coverage on the head the other cool thing uh, that Jason and Tom mentioned was that with those finer droplets what they're actually finding is it gets caught up on the ons so it actually doesn't even reach the head so it'll actually get stuck on the ons. so that's the other thing with finer droplets is not only can they get carried away but it can actually get 
caught up in the ons and we don't reach the target. So that's nozzles, but we also have our speed, our boom height and our water volumes. So what happens when you have your boom super high, your, those droplets have more time to fall, more time to go off target. Uh, so again, we want to try to keep our booms as low as we possibly can without hitting anything. We don't want to hit weed heads. Um, but, and if you can't keep it level, I know nobody likes me or anyone to say this, but slow down. <laughs> uh, so we want to well, keep that boom and, nice and level. <laughs> yeah, well, and Jay, Jay, and Jay and Tom would tell you that if you don't want to slow down, you need to figure out how to get your refill times faster so you can slow down in the field. So, okay, yes, carry on. Exactly. Just so by slowing down, yeah. we are able to lower our boom height because then we don't not worry about that boom going all over the place, hitting the ground. Um, if we can slow down, we can optimize our boom height and ensure that that product actually reaches the target that we're trying to hit. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was spray volume. Uh, so I know as a custom guys, we don't want to spray carry a lot uh, of extra weight. We don't want to carry lots of water volume. It's time consuming, uh, all those fun things. Um, but really where the optimum uh, water volumes is 20 gallons per acre. So we see a huge benefit from 10 to 20 gallons per acre. So we get good coverage, we get good droplet sizes. What happens is if you go to 10 gallons per acre, you actually don't have enough volume to get those coarse droplets. So you just run out of volume, you run out of product. Um, the higher volumes, once we go to 30 gallons per acre, we don't see as much of a benefit from 10 to 20 as we do from 20 to 30. Um, but again, the higher volumes, uh, so they don't impact Dawn. Uh, there's lots of good work been on done that. But again, the biggest the biggest benefit from higher water volumes is good coverage, and we're able to get those optimum droplet sizes. Um, so yeah, that's my <laughs> initial thoughts. Yeah, I like it. Thank you, because this is definitely one of those ones every single year at this timing. Pete is absolutely bang on. Everyone is like, remind me again. What am I supposed to be doing? So definitely something to do. Now, Kelly, we've got a question here, and this is probably where we'll we'll end tonight because somehow we're already just about at nine o'clock here Eastern. Um, so Jason out of Manitoba says we have uneven spring wheat emergence because of the dry soil conditions. What are your experiences on two applications or a split application to try and capture the majority of those two stages at the right T3 timing? So Kelly, if you can sort of tackle this, because I know this sort of brings in one of the other topics of, you know, do we spray later, right? Oh, you might be muted, Kelly. There I am go. actually, thank you. That's, uh, that's so all right. Some of our work right now, we're actually looking at uh, single versus dual applications. And I would say my general uh, feeling, uh, both in terms of FHB work that we're, we're doing currently and previous leaf disease control work, especially in barley, is that those dual applications, especially at flag to head emergence for leaf disease management, really benefit in terms of grain filling and so on. In terms of fusarium, we do see a benefit with regard to FTK. Uh, there's some indication of, of, of uh, benefit to, in terms of Dawn. I guess that's a really challenging question. I guess I would look at the uh, percentage of the crop that's at a, a key growth stage. And you know, I guess you're 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 juggling the label recommendations in terms of growth stage and then pre-harvest interval. But if it's a couple of different growth stages, that you know your pre-harvest interval might be long enough. But certainly, you know, if you have a significant proportion of the crop that is behind, uh, that means that if you put that fungicide on uh, sort of the the earlier merging heads you could see quite a, a significant compromise as far as efficacy and, and control because that second crop of heads is going to be hit more heavily. You know, I would look at the weather conditions. Uh, Joe talked about uh, the dawn cast. We have similar things here in Western Canada, primarily based on the DeWolf uh, model out of uh, Purdue, uh, Eric DeWolf. But you could look at that to give you an indication and maybe for what it's worth the forecast over the next two weeks. And, you know, if, if things are starting to turn dry, it might mean that that second flush of heads may be at a lower risk and your, your focus maybe should be more on the, the first sort of crop of heads that come out or conversely, if it's dry and then you start to see a forecast for more unsettled conditions, maybe perhaps you'd see 
better response by delaying and hitting that second crop of heads. Well, and with crop prices where they are, if the water comes, there's going to be a crop there that's going to be worth a lot. So let's hope that the water uh, comes. <laughs> certainly certain parts of the prairies for sure could really use another drenching. Jason has a follow-up question, but I'm going to save it for the next time Jay and Tom are on. Um, although Pete is probably going to handle it in the comments. It's about uh, sort of extra well, things you can add to the tank. Yeah. So, I could, uh, I could so. touch on it really oh, fast if you want. Sorry. Yeah. Right, so yeah. Okay. So yeah. So the question is <laughs> yeah. um, water droplet dispersing products. So there, we do have some surfactants and, and those sorts of things coming to market. Um, what role do they have here in fusarium uh, control or suppression? Yeah, so I, so Peter, I see also responded to that quick, but yeah, so the key with those products, so they will reduce the fines, um, but they won't increase the number of coarse droplet sizes. So you'll reduce the amount of fines, but you won't get an increase in that. Um, you also, uh, you will get a decrease maybe mm -hmm. in drift and evapotranspiration, that sort of thing, but it won't improve the efficacy or the coverage or the trajectory of those droplets. Uh, so really at the end of the day, it is about getting the right nozzle and getting the job done right versus trying to add something to the tank to remediate some of that. And slow down. Um, and slow right. down. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no one likes to hear that. Okay, we are out of time. Um, and I, amazingly, I did get to the last clip, but we skipped one. But whatever. One of these days, I'm going to get to all three of them. Um, so Joanna Fallings, Kelly Trickington, thank you so much for being my guest tonight. Well, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. And Peter, uh, thank you. Joanna did have time, but I do appreciate when uh, we've got experts in the chat as well that can handle some of the questions that come in. That is our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you head over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist to get your CEU credits. And uh, we'll see you next week, 8 p.m. Eastern. Bye now.